or Grace. Grace, that's you. Um, and thanks for joining us here tonight. Most of you know Bear Pond has been hosting a holiday book drive with Cliff Children's Literacy Foundation for many years. It's an organization near and dear to my heart. And what you may not know is that we also have a tremendous list of local authored and illustrated children's books published this past year. So I decided that we should make a joy sandwich and encourage all of you to vote to support both Cliff's programming and our Vermont artists at the same time. Thus, our fight song for the evening is buy local, give local, buy a gift, give a gift. And here's how you can do that. You can purchase gifts for loved ones and for Cliff's donations on our website from the list of books found there using the link that Samantha will drop in the chat for you, it's probably already there now. Tonight only we'll be offering 15% 15, 15 off any quantity of books from that list. And all you need to do to receive the discount is type the promo code CLIF, C-L-I-F, in the coupon box to receive your discount. If you have questions about website ordering, you can drop them in the chat. Sam's here to help you navigate that. Um, you can also, if you can't buy tonight, you can also pop in the store and we will give you 15% off um, the Cliff books when you come in and mm -hmm. we will have our um, Cliff fairs here available like we have every year. Um, so before we move on to the fun part, I'm just gonna you know, uh, go over the housekeeping again. Our program will last one hour. All attendees will be muted. If you have any questions or comments, you can drop them into the chat, like I said. We'll try to leave some time at the end of the program for some Q&A because I know we all are itching to raise a ruckus. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to read our introductions and then the um, presenters will, will follow up. So we'll first hear from Duncan McDougall who founded Cliff in 1998. He's given a few thousand literacy and storytelling presentations to children and parents throughout New Hampshire and Vermont. Duncan comes to literacy work by way of his business management consulting work in Boston. He's also a freelance writer, teacher, and radio commentator, and is active in local and political environmental campaigns. Duncan sees firsthand the enthusiasm with which kids choose a book during Cliff programming and can vouch for the power of storytelling and children's agency in book choices. We're so excited to collaborate with Cliff again this season. Next up will be Lita Schubert. Lita's been a teacher, librarian, and a consultant for the Vermont Department of Education. She holds an MFA in writing for children and young adults from Vermont College, where she was also on faculty. Her books include Monsieur Marceau, Actor Without Words, which won the or Orbis Pictus Award for Outstanding Nonfiction. She wrote Ballet of the Elephant, Listen, How Pete Seeger Got America Singing. Some of these you'll see behind me. Winnie All Day Long, Winnie Plays Ball. Nathan's Song, which was published earlier this year. She lives in Plainfield, where my favorite lady book was inspired called Here Comes Daryl. Her new picture book, Dogs Love Cars, which you can hold that up, Lita, because we don't have it yet, will be landing on our doorstep any moment. And she has another picture book in the hopper called First and Last, the Changing Seasons, which is due out in 2022. Now, if Lita ever tells you she's quit writing books, do not believe her. <laughs> then we will hear from Christy Mahali. Christy is a former lawyer who decided a decade ago that writing for kids would be much more fun. She writes stories, poetry, and nonfiction, including titles on topics for free speech, to food, to fashion. Her previous books include Free for You and Me, What Our First Amendment Means, Amendment Means, Diet for a Changing Planet, and Hey, 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 A Tale of Veils and Machines That Make Them. Christy just published Water, which is in my hot hand, a deep dive of discovery. She will also have a busy upcoming year. The Supreme Court of Us will be published next March. Patience Patches, Patches will be published in April, and the Ultimate Food Atlas will be published by National Geographic Kids next fall. Christy makes her home in Callis, where she does a lot of picture book zooming with the grandchildren. Christy was a presenter at Cliff's programming this past summer. And then after Christy, we will hear from Catherine Patterson. Catherine is both a local and international treasure. She's the author of more than 30 books, must be way more than that now, including 16 novels for children and young people. She's twice won the Newbery Medal for Bridge to Terabithia in 1978 and Jacob Have I Loved in 1981. 
the Master Puppeteer won the National Book Award in 1977, and the Great Gilly Hopkins won the National Book Award in 1979, and was also a Newbery Honor Book. For the body of her work, she received the Hans Christian Andersen Award in 1998, the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award in 2006, and in 2000 was named a living legend by the Library of Congress. Catherine is on the Board of Trustees for Vermont College of Fine Art, and she was the 2010 and 11 National Ambassador for Young People's Literature. Catherine's new novel is Birdie's Bargain. So I'm gonna fade in the background and I'm gonna let um, Duncan take it away now. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, this is the highlight of my week. Uh, this feels a lot like a Cliff family reunion because there are so many folks on this call, including those speaking, who've been involved with Cliff. I see some former uh, Cliff advisors, uh, Joanna Rudge Long and uh, Grace um, Worcester, and uh, lots of presenters. And um, actually, Jane Knight is on our board of advisors. And Lita used to be a Cliff presenter, and Christy and Catherine are Cliff presenters. Uh, and they are a huge part of what we do. So for the few of you who don't know Cliff, uh, the Children's Literacy Foundation is a nonprofit that was started 24 years ago. And our mission is to nurture a love of reading and writing among low-income, at-risk, and rural children from birth to age 12 throughout Vermont and New Hampshire. And we, when we say throughout, we mean throughout. Uh, we've been in more than 425 towns. And since we started, we've worked with more than 350,000 young readers and writers uh, and uh, have given away more than $9 million worth of brand new, beautiful books. And just this past year, uh, we gave away about a million dollar worth of books um, to kids in uh, shelters, low-income housing, uh, foster kids, migrant kids, refugee kids. Uh, we work in prisons across New Hampshire and Vermont and uh, help connect families through uh, stories and books. Uh, we work with libraries and schools, uh, child care centers, Head Start programs. The list is long. But many people, when they think of Cliff, they think of the books, and we certainly give away lots of beautiful books. But really, I think the heart of Cliff are our presenters. So we have more than 60 professional presenters, all of whom who live in New Hampshire or Vermont, and they have a wonderful body of work to share, and they are absolutely inspiring with kids. And we're so proud and honored to have them going out and spreading the word with us about the power and the pleasure of books and stories and reading and writing. And as I said, Lita and, and Christy and Catherine uh, and David Martin and others on this call uh, have been part of that group. And so the Children's Literacy Foundation um, travels all over New Hampshire and Vermont, face to face with kids, wherever they might be, if it's in a shelter, uh, it's in a small library, whatever that might be. And we inspire the kids. And then every event involves letting the kids choose what books they want to keep from hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of beautiful titles that we bring. We've had a wonderful partnership with Bear Pond Books uh, for many years. And uh, it's, it's just fantastic because they gather through their uh, generous customers, many new books that we can give away. And I would guess that probably roughly half of the kids that we serve through our programs um, have few or no books at home. And I encourage everyone to go visit our website which is cliffonline.org, C-L-I-F-O-N-L-I-N-E.org. And you can read about our nine programs and we're always looking for new places to help because all our programs are free. The last quick thing I'll mention briefly is we are completely community supported. We don't receive state or federal funds. So programs like this and support like a support we've received from Bear Pond Books means a huge amount to us. So I am proud and delighted to be here. I thank uh, Jane, and Sam and everyone at Bear Pond Books. And I can't wait to hear from Lita and Christy and Catherine. Oh, me. Um, hi. Welcome everybody. It's so good to see so many familiar names and thanks for coming and how wonderful. And um, I suggest that you put your screen on speaker view. So, cause I'm gonna show some pictures and they're gonna be too little if you keep the uh, in uh, gallery view. So everybody knows how to use Zoom by now or you wouldn't be here. Although I have to say that when we first started uh, seeing people in real life, I wondered how I was supposed to mute them because they were there they were right in front of me and I could not figure out how to deal with it. So I started writing 
No, that's not where I'm starting. I didn't pre actually prepare anything. Um, this is my motto. I don't know. I hope you can see this. It's from 1976. It's a cartoon by the great George Booth, and it says, write about dogs. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So um, it took me a long time to be able to do that. My first books came out when I was 50, and my last books are coming out this year and next year. And who knows what happens after that. And I've had three books that are being published during the pandemic. And I have to say, it's not the best thing in the world. Um, it's hard to get people to know about them. It's hard to get out there. It's hard to publicize. I hate self-promotion, but I love the books. So I'm glad to be here with all of you. God, I sound like I'm, I don't know what. So um, this is the book that's coming out next week, Dogs Love Cars, um, Candle with Quest. My editor might even be somewhere on this call by now. She just had knee surgery and she's in pain, but she is a great editor, lives with me. Dogs love cars. I'm going to read you a little bit and uh, leave you wanting more, I hope. Although I have, well, never mind. So there's the, the illustrator. Okay, Dogs Love Cars by me, illustrated by Paul Mygel. End papers filled with things that dogs love. And I'll read you the dedication because all my beloved dogs are in it. To Franz, Juno, Quillo, Ebenezer, Pignolia, Smee, Winnie, Pogo, Pippa, and Bunky, and to Bob, who is a person. <laughs> dogs love cars. Dogs, oh God. <laughs> dogs love cars. It's very hard to fit this on a little teeny screen. That's not in the book, that's me. Any car, old or new, windows down, noses out, ears flopping, smelling grass and trees, smelling people, smelling other dogs, drooling on the glass, car wash. Dogs love walks. Can you see okay? Short walks and long walks, up hills and down, walks in cities and countryside, fast and slow walks, off leash and on. Oops. Dogs, not dogs. Big dogs, little dogs, dachshunds and golden doodles, barking, licking, smelling, wagging, chasing, running, falling down, rolling, getting up. Bath time. And I'll stop there. And I just want to say that this book, you never quite know what you're writing until you're done and you look at it, I think. And I finally figured out this book is all about loving dogs. <laughs> it took me a while. <laughs> I also had a book come out a few months ago that dropped into a black hole, but it's not too late. It's still in print. And it's called Nathan's Song. And it's based on the story of my grandfather, Nathan Brofman, who was a wonderful singer in Russia. And although his family was very poor, he was allowed to go to Italy to study opera. And unfortunately, he got drunk the night before the boat left for Italy. And he ended up in Brazil, um, which was not close to Italy. And he had to learn Brazilian and Portuguese. And he had to make his way to New York City. And I based this story rather loosely on his life. I left out the part about him getting drunk because I thought that was not quite appropriate for children, um, but I can tell it to you. And uh, I'll just read you the first two pages of this. And if you go to my website, LitaSchubert.com, you can actually hear a recording of my grandfather singing, which is the only recording that survives him. And uh, of course it moves me to tears. So this is the illustration. From the time Nathan was a little boy in Russia, he loved to sing. He sang when he stacked wood, he sang when he peeled potatoes, and he sang when he fetched water from the well. That Nathan, said the neighbors, he can lift your heart with his voice. Everyone in Nathan's shtetl taught him their favorite songs and he sang them all.
One day, a famous opera singer gave a concert in the next village. Nathan and his family were there. I did not know anything could be so beautiful, said Nathan. I want to sing like that. Then you must study in Italy, Papa said. The best teachers are there. But how can I go, Nathan said. We have no money. We will find a way, said Mama. And then I am incredibly fortunate to have a third book coming out, also probably during the pandemic, <laughs> called Firsts and Last, A Book of Seasons. And I hope that you can see that in February, also from Candlelit. And that's really all I want to say. I'd like to hear what Christy has to say and what Catherine has to say. And I hope you have questions. And now I'm not quite as nervous as I was when I started. <laughs> Thank you, Lita. Shall I go? Lita, that was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say that I got uh, Lita's book, um, uh, Nathan's song uh, at Bear Pond Books, and I have to bring it back in so I can get a, a signature on it. Um, but I read it to my uh, grandson, Nathan, on Zoom across the ocean because he's in Switzerland, and Nathan gave it a big thumbs up. I don't think I'll tell him about the getting drunk part, but I will go on that website to listen to the singing. That sounds wonderful. Um, so Jane, you are really large on my screen. Is the speaker view working for people? Because I will also show um, my book. Okay. Um, um, I also wanted to say thank you to um, Duncan and to say that with Cliff, it goes both ways. The presenters get so much out of sharing with the kids, sharing books, sharing about writing, um, sharing the excitement of it all. And um, I love Cliff in part because I see how much joy the kids get, but also because it really makes me feel good too. So um, thank you, Cliff, for that. <clears throat> Um, I also, as Jane said, have a, uh, a, a book. It just came across the water. It was delayed about six weeks. Um, and finally, the supply chain loosened up uh, enough for, for it to show up. Um, this is a book by Barefoot Books, which creates gorgeous books. Um, and the story behind this book is that Barefoot Books, the publisher decided they wanted a book about water. They said, we've got books about oceans. We've got books about the animals of the ocean. We've got books um, you know, about uh, the water cycle, but we, don't, we want a book that's all about water. So can you write this book? So <laughs> that, was, that was quite a, a, a charge, um, but we did. Um, they came to me in um, March of 2020. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was about to um, start on this uh, series of events to uh, share my prior book that came out in March, 2020, and everything was canceled. And I said, oh, I happen to have a little bit of spare time. So I spent a, a year going back and forth with the editor across the ocean. Uh, she actually is in, oops, sorry about that. Hold on one sec, I'm gonna mute that. While Christy's gone, here is the book that came out during the pandemic that we couldn't celebrate. We were just about to have a great event with her and some other nonfiction writers. It's called Free for You and Me. So we have plenty of them at Bear Pond Books if you want it. Hi. Sorry about that. So um, that book, um, all of the events were canceled. And so I spent um, a year working with the, the editors and the team. The cool thing about the team at Barefoot Books is that it was an incredibly collaborative process. We went uh, back and forth on the art and the presentation. We ended up with a book that has fold out flaps and all kinds of fun features. Um, and I, it, it's really a pleasure to hold it in my hands. So it's essentially a nonfiction book, 
about the um, all about water, including the water cycle, the states of water, the ocean currents, and how they affect our weather. Um, but we also wanted to make it poetic, um, and we also included. Um, folk tales, so fictional tales from uh, storytellers around the world. Barefoot Books is a very um, global publisher and they wanted to include stories from storytellers all around the world. And in the back of the book, there's a little profile of each of the folks whose um, folktale retellings are included. So they're, they're sort of interspersed throughout the nonfiction chunks of the book. So I'd like to just read the, the very beginning of it. Look at the gorgeous art. Mary, Mariona Cabasa is the illustrator, and she is in Barcelona, Spain. And that's her, uh, her illustration of the beginning spread, which starts like this. Plip, plop, plitter, plush. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the heading. Raindrops fall around the globe. Raindrops fall from the clouds onto rooftops and umbrellas, cars and gardens. What happens to the rain? Where does the water go? Raindrops fall around the world onto cities and forests and fields. They sink into soil and plop into puddles. Eventually in a day or a month or over many years, the water will find its way to the ocean Earth's ocean covers most of the planet's surface. The oceans are so vast that when astronauts look down from space, Earth looks mostly blue. But Earth's water doesn't just sit there, it's in motion, even within the ocean. So um, we go on from there, and I'm not going to read this entire book, um, but it starts with some of the facts of water, how much water there is on the earth. But then we have little dive deeper features. I have little lift the flaps, which I love. Um, and this one is, it's talking about the amount of water on earth and um, we can lift the flap and, and uh, kids can ask what activities use the most water. Um, washing your hands, how much water does that take? A gallon if you leave the water running. And then um, inviting kids to think about how they might use less water and um, save water. And uh, the, the idea of this book is to get kids so excited about the wonder and beauty of water that without saying in so many words, we also get them excited about um, being a steward of water and how important it is. Um, and it's also, we are increasingly learning um, a, a very big part of um, the impacts of global warming on the earth and uh, the, the ocean currents, the warming of the ocean, all those things. We mentioned them here, but the, the theme of the book is how awesome water is and uh, how cool it is. So that's, that's water. Um, Lita got to say more than one book, so I will just very quickly mention uh, Free For You and Me. Um, I also have a passion in addition to the environment. I have a passion for civics and education, uh, civics education and good government. And um, so with this book, I dove into how to introduce kids to constitutional law um, in, a, you know, in a picture book. What I did was I started with the First Amendment. This is the First Amendment only. And I ended up writing poems about each of the five freedoms that are protected in the First Amendment. So freedom of speech and the press and religion, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, freedom of assembly and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances, take that, Amy Comey Barrett. Um, and so um, there are poems in here about each of the freedoms. I'm just gonna give you a small flavor of it with freedom of the press. We've got this. This is illustrated by Manu Montoya, who coincidentally also lives in Spain. Freedom of the press. In a democracy, people need news, facts to consider when forming their views. That's why reporters keep track of events 
asking hard questions to help things make sense. They tell us the facts of the world on our screens and on podcasts in papers and news magazines. Knowledge is power. Free press is the key. We must know the truth if we want to stay free. And this spread introduces a cast of kid characters who are going to use their First Amendment freedoms to uh, address a local, a local dispute in their town. So that is free for you and me. I think that's probably um, all I want to say. I'm looking forward to some conversations uh, between the three of us and looking forward to hearing Catherine. So thank you. Thank you, Christy. And welcome, Catherine. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I only had one book out. And I only have one book out every few years. <laughs> um, but I'm old and that's, no, that's not my excuse because that's all the way, that's always been the way I've done it. <laughs> I just finished a book and I think, well, that was a good career while it lasted, but <laughs> I'll never have another book worthy idea or ideas. And then my, I used to be my family got worried and then they just started rolling their eyes. But my dog doesn't pay any attention at all. And so I've, I've put her in the other room because I don't want her to make comments. Um, I thought I'd just, if you don't mind, just read aloud from Bertie's Bargain. I don't know if you can see Bertie's Bargain, uh, but, uh, I will uh, just read you the part where she makes the bargain and then you can have a taste of what's going to happen. Her grandmother was back at the door. You haven't eaten all day, she said. Let me fix you something. What do you want? What did she want? It was what she didn't want. First of all, she had never wanted a little brother, but mostly, mostly she didn't want her daddy to go to Iraq and die. She hadn't wanted terrorists to hit the Twin Towers. And all these years later, there were still terrorists everywhere. Everybody said so. She didn't want to go to bed every night wondering if she'd wake up in the morning. She didn't want to die. And she would. Everybody did. People pretended that she wouldn't. Or they'd say, only when you're really old and don't want to live anymore. But that was a lie. Why did grown-ups lie all the time? Reverend Colson at Bible camp said it was against the commandments of God to lie. Gran was still waiting for an answer. I'm okay. Bertie lied and turned her face to the wall. Well, God should know lying was different for kids. Sometimes they just had to lie. She stopped herself. Suppose God was listening. Well, of course God was listening, stupid. God heard everything. She didn't mean she was so sick of the world that she wanted to die. No, she just wanted everything different. Why couldn't God roll history backward as well as forward? Why couldn't he go back to September 10, 2001 and fix things? So the next day was an ordinary sunny day in the fall and not the start of two wars and horribleness. She was God. She'd sure run things differently. Like press reset and let a new story take the place of the terrible one. God wasn't going to do anything of the sort. Okay, so he wouldn't start over like with Noah and the flood. But couldn't he just let someone in her family win the lottery or something so they'd have enough money and mom didn't have to go to work while daddy was overseas so they wouldn't have to move to Grand's because rent on the apartment would be too high. And she wouldn't have to start in a brand new school where she didn't have any friends. Had the thought of that being alone and friendless, when God knew perfectly well that she was shy and had a hard time making friends. Remember that first summer at Bible camp? The rock inside her that had kept the tears dammed up broke loose 
She began to cry like a baby, so loudly that she was sure her grandmother could hear her through the walls. She pulled the covers as well as the pillow over her head and cried into the black cave they made. When the flood finally subsided, she wiped her nose at the pillowcase. Of course, that was it. That was what she had to do. Bertie sat up straight on the bed, then hesitated. Maybe with something this important, she better kneel and show God she meant business. Reverend Colston always said it was good to kneel down when you prayed. It showed you were humble before God. Bertie got down beside her bed. The covers tickled her nose, but she'd make the bed up after. Now she put her hands together like that praying hands picture they hang in pictures churches okay god no dear heavenly father that was better dear heavenly father i'll stop acting like a jerk if you'll start acting like god and take care of us for a change no erase that last part i'll get up right now and start acting normal if you i mean I will love you and Jesus and be a witness in the world if you will just keep my daddy safe, okay? Deal? Promise? Love, Bertie. I mean, I'm in. Slowly, she opened her eyes and stood up. Light was pouring through the one small window onto the floor. Light. I am the light of the world. Jesus said that. It was like Noah's rainbow, a promise. God was telling her. It was a bargain. Well, if you've ever, ever read any of my books, you know that it's not going to be easy for poor Bertie from here on out. I always give him a hard, hard time. But I guess you'll have to read the book and find out how that bargain works out. Uh, and I think we want to have questions and conversation, right, Jane? We do. So if anybody has comments or questions, put them in the chat. And I was hoping that maybe um, for this part, and also discussion, but when we do have um, q and would hopefully we can um, un, you know, we can see everybody. I'd like if, if Sam can make it happen. Um, it would be kind of fun to see everybody's faces for the this latter part of the of the um, event. So Sam's going to see if she can do that. Um, and Sam, let us know if that's possible. Um, if you do, in the meantime, have have any questions for these folks, let us know. Um, I was just wondering, number one, is Birdie's Bargain going to be um, on audio, Catherine? Are they going to uh, make an audio book? Yes. It's, it's, I think it's already on audio, maybe. Uh, and uh, Great, that's exciting, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, just to get sort of the discussion moving, I'm just wondering if any of you, Lita, Christy, Catherine, have you been able to get out with your books into the world in any meaningful way in the past couple of years? I certainly haven't. It has been rough. <laughs> um, you haven't at all, Lita? No, I just did last month. Um, Barefoot Books um, opened up its office. They had spent the, the entire pandemic, uh, they moved into a new office and redecorated. Sort of like Duncan is hoping to do soon. And um, they had they threw this big open house. Everyone was wearing masks, um, but um, it was, people were so happy to be gathered in this space where everyone loved books. And they invited people from the community to see their new offices. And we did some book signing. Um, and it's amazing how after you haven't done it for a year and a half, for two years, how, how cool it really is. <laughs> So yeah, that it was fun to be doing it again last month. Yeah, I, I uh, well, I did. I, I've just sort of zoomed myself to death this past year, uh, but I, I have now done two trips, and um, Saturday I was at a 
another bookstore on the other uh, side of the state. So it's all right. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to uh, get out in the world and see people. And, and I've been known to hug people. And, uh, but I figured 89, you've had a good life. What does it matter? And Duncan, you've been able to keep a lot of your programming going as well through the, through the pandemic. We have. We have. Um, actually, this past year, we uh, saw more kids and gave away more books than ever before. Um, but it's been a little bit different, as I was saying earlier. A lot of our events are all fully masked. Uh, until recently, since it's getting a little cooler, uh, many of the programs were outside. Um, and um, we've also done some events in, in a school gym where the classes are like little islands. They're all separated by certain space. And um, so it's, it's very different. We do, uh, we're trying not to do recorded events because uh, the power of what we do really comes through hearing Catherine in person and hearing Christy and others. Uh, that's where it really happens. So we always hope that people can go face to face, but if that's not um, possible safely, then we come up with some other ways. I have to say that aside from possibly losing book sales, which I know is happening, I, I uh, am a hermit and um, it's been nice not to have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you can tell that I actually have lost the gift of public speaking and um, become extremely nervous now. So I better get back in the saddle. <laughs> You're not alone, Lita. We all feel that way. Well, Lita, come on. I think maybe if you're writing that many books, you're doing better than I am. Well, <laughs> I mean, we are them. supposed to be writers, you know, uh, <laughs> and not speakers. As some of you might know, it takes a very long time for a picture book to come out. So it's not like I wrote them all recently. Um, <laughs> I, but I've been very lucky with these last three books, I must say. I love the editors. I love the illustrators. I love the whole thing. Mm. Well, they're beautiful books. Thank you. And I can't wait to read both of yours. My internet disappeared during Christie's uh, discussion, as it does, but I'm glad it's being recorded. <laughs> yes, you'll have to you'll have to listen to all the nice things I said about your books. <laughs> If I can ask a quick question, I'm curious from the authors um, on this call, um, is it getting more difficult to get a book published these days? Are publishing houses getting uh, pickier or looking for people who can guarantee a certain number of books? What is the uh, environment like for publishing books these days? Sigh. <laughs> Catherine is not a, a, a reliable narrator on this. I'm not what, Lena? A reliable narrator. <laughs> oh, I'm not a reliable narrator. Well, I mean, if you only pr produce a book every three or so years, <laughs> it's not and, much of a problem. And people, then people are really waiting for it and they publish it immediately. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, in the in the very over the pandemic, things slowed down, everything slowed down. And what I'm hearing is that the editors are, you know, the, the, the everything is taking even longer than it took before. I have I have certainly heard that. Well, I've just felt so sorry for new writers whose first books came out during the pandemic and who really had no opportunity to promote those books because I think when people see you, um, they're more likely to buy your book if they don't know you, uh, your name ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just think, gee whiz, <laughs> that's, that's so rough to be so excited about having a book bought and then published and then have it come out right in the middle of chaos when people weren't really thinking about, oh, let's go to the bookstore, let's go to the <laughs> library, or let, you know, let's buy a new book. Uh, and so those are the people who really suffered, not those of us who've been at it for 50 years. Although I do have to say that uh, I've been reading more than ever, so there's that, and buying books right and left. 
Yes, didn't didn't book sales go up, uh, Bear Pond Books people? Yes, they had. We had um, last year was one of our best years on record. But let's so say it <laughs> that's that's my peer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, that's that's not the rest of the country. <laughs> but I do have to say, in the New England area, most of the bookstores were were you know echoing our sentiments. That's so. right. No, no, that's right. I shouldn't. Anywhere it works, <laughs> we should all rejoice. Right, right. Yeah. Questions out there? Do we have any questions from you attendees here who haven't seen these folks in so long? I have a question. Can I ask my question? Like Catherine Davis. Um, Catherine are, Davis. Any, are any of you thinking that you want to write something about the pandemic or do you want to just leave it behind forever we write I, I write children's picture books i'm i'm, I'm leaving it behind <laughs> i'm seeing some books for children come out about you know life during the pandemic brian floca has a beautiful new book out which i haven't actually held in my hands about um the workers, the people who did the essential workers, ah, Jane is going to get it. And I've <laughs> seen some other books around, but I, I have, I'm not going to try. Mm, no. Sharon, anybody else? No. Oh, Jane has the book. Jane is going to show us one. I don't know if you can see, it's called Keeping the City Going by Brian Floca. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. I think it reflects New York City and all of um, the essential workers that it takes to keep things running smoothly. And of course, Brian Floca is amazing. His illustrations are wonderful. So yes, this was on staff recommend um, for a month or so. Yeah, that's a good one. Aaron November just asked us what we're reading. And you know, I don't have my list in front of me, but yesterday I finished Richard Powers' new book, Bewilderment. Um, I just read Louise Erdrich's The Night Watchmen. Um, what else have we read? Oh, Zori by Laird Hunt, one of my favorite books ever, which is dominant. Did you just ask your dog? Did, Lita, did you just ask your dog? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my admiration for dogs has only increased. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, dogs make the most wonderful COVID companions, especially if, uh, you're widowed or single, and and uh, as, I mean, they, and my it may just be my dog, but uh, <laughs> my, my, <laughs> wonderful. But I I, I wanted to uh, tell you about a book that I I read recently because I met the author and we did a program together in in Bristol, Tennessee, and that's Fighting Words by Kimberly uh, Rubaker. Bradley, uh -huh. and uh, oh, I just think that's a magnificent book. Uh, she's also a, a wonderful person and, and does the same thing that that Cliff does, only in Appalachia. Uh, and of course, uh, he. Oh. Yes, the war, she, the war that saved my life is uh, um, maybe her best known book, but she's a remarkable writer and a remarkable woman. I'm sorry, Lita, what, what did you say? What has Christy read? Um, I have just finished reading This is Happiness by Neil Williams, Love Irish it. writer. Wonderful book, wonderful book. It starts out kind of slowly, but I just found myself relaxing into it. And um, it, it, yeah, it was a nice Love escape. Yeah, Bob and I both love that. Hmm. Other questions? Come on, folks. I know you're dying to ask some questions. Can I jump in and say what I just read? Yes. Yeah, sure, of course. Only because Jane knows the story. It's so funny. So I'm Samantha at Bear Pond Books. Hi, everyone. I've been doing the back end stuff. I have a five-year-old daughter. 
she went to the library the other day at Kellogg Hubbard and she went with a neighbor. She came home with a book for mommy that she picked out for me, which was hysterical because I usually pick out her books. And it was Jacob Have I Loved. Oh. <laughs> I tell her I am thrilled. Wonderful. <laughs> and she asked me, mommy, did you read this book? And I said, yeah, I think I read it when I was 10. <laughs> and she goes, did you love it? And I said, yes, I did. And she goes, that's why I got it for you, mommy. <laughs> you know, I met my husband, Bob. I made him read that book before I would marry him. And if he didn't perfect. love it, we were not getting married. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Did you know that, Catherine? That's, that's big. Well, I would certainly not want to to stand in the way of that marriage because I have to be very fond of both partners. <laughs> and it would have been all right if he hadn't read it. It's a one when, when, when he hadn't married you. I just reread it and I just, it's beautiful. And if you haven't read it since you were younger, um, I think it has a different, you get different meanings from it. At least I did um, as an older reader. And so I just wanted to let you know, Catherine, then that was a, a lovely read and very unexpected, was not on my TBR pile, which are usually books for like next year, which is what I'm reading now. But um, it was nice to revisit that classic. Well, I, I appreciate it, but I think you've just said something important. And that is how, if we come to the same book at a different point in our lives, it's a different book. And it's kind of wonderful to revisit books that we read once uh, and then and then reread them and say, oh, I don't remember that. Or, yeah. or well, we're older and, and uh, we have had a different experience of life. So it makes, it makes a big difference. In yes. quick presentations, I often tell kids that I love rereading books um, because it's like visiting old friends. And I sure. know what their quirks are, what they find amusing, what they find challenging, and it's fun to, to spend time with them. Um, so rereading books is wonderful. I, I actually, um, I just read a, a great book, Desert Queen, which I hadn't read before about Gertrude Bell, an amazing woman who um, explored all of uh, the Arabian Peninsula uh, when that was not the thing to do back in yeah. the century. Um, and um, I, speaking of rereading, I'm uh, rereading for probably the fifth time, the Lord of the Rings series, just because mm -hmm. it's magical writing. I love to read it. Yeah. Um, I think Michael Sherman, and he disappeared. Michael. Oh, he's there. Here I am. Uh, well, I, I have a question um, about when you write, are you are you thinking as much about the adults who might be reading these books to their kids as you are about thinking about the kids who are reading it on their own. Who wants to go? Well, I, I don't want to talk too much, but I, I don't think about the readers when I'm writing the book. Isn't that terrible? Is that's probably terrible. Uh, I'm thinking about the story and, and trying to listen to the story and how it wants to be written. And uh, I mean, at some point, I I begin thinking about readers. I guess, like, who in the world is going to ever read this book? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but actually, when I'm in the middle of it, Michael, I, I don't I don't worry about readers. I just worry about trying to tell the best story I can. I don't think about the readers either, which may be a problem. <laughs> 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 for maybe if for you certainly for me <laughs> i mean you know when you're writing for young children i think you have to pay some attention but i just maybe certainly not on the first few drafts and i do a lot of drafts claire christy Chrissy. you christy I, I do. I do think about the readers, both the kids and the parents, because I, I do imagine in the, in the process of creating the book, a parent reading to a child, um, as well as, you know, a child picking it up and, and, and wanting to, you know, you know, wanting it to be accessible to them. Um, 
But I, I think that in the picture book world, uh, people know that the purchasers of the books are, are the uh, adults. And so you are, you are wanting your book to be appealing to adults as well as the little ones. We have a question from Sydney Lee and Robin Barone. It's for Catherine. Catherine, what do you, book do you find yourself rereading? Rereading uh, Jane Austen. <laughs> um, and uh, Marilyn Robinson. Um, and then if it's a book that I remember having read but can't remember what in the world happened in the book, sometimes I'll read it just out of curiosity. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, I guess among modern writers, Marilyn Robinson is the one I've, I've reread the most. Uh, I think Gilead's such a masterpiece. Uh. Anyone else want to pop in and ask a question? I'm wondering what you're all looking forward to most when we get over this hump, if I can call it that. <laughs> a hard question to answer because as I was saying, I'm sort of a hermit and um, I think, you know, I've developed some habits during the pandemic that I'm not proud of, including watching too many Scandinavian uh, crime dramas. <laughs> I like to justify that by saying that I'm learning new languages. So I now speak Danish, Finnish, Swedish, Icelandic. <laughs> and we also now know that Norway actually touches Russia, which we didn't believe for a long time. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to maybe dropping some of the bad habits I've developed. But um, I'd like to see more friends, but not in large groups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's been an interesting period of time. Mm -hmm. What about the rest of you? Can Live you music. Know? Live music. I forgot mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that, I really miss that. And um, I, I, we actually have tickets for a, an event, and I, I'm feeling really uncomfortable about going. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we'll put on our masks and we'll show our vaccination cards and we'll uh, and we'll we'll go. And I, I yeah, live music will be nice. As a storyteller, I'm looking forward to being able to tell stories where kids can actually see my expressions. Yeah, and I'm, I, can't, I can't wait to tell stories and be able to see the kids expressions. Uh, it's it's challenging when no one can really see how people are reacting. Yeah. Yes, I think that we all look forward to seeing people's faces again. Not on a screen. Not on a screen. <laughs> Jane, what are you looking forward to? Live music definitely is on the top of the list. Um, I'm a hermit as well, so I'm happy when I'm home. But, um, so, but I get my socializing out at work. Um, so I realize when certain people come in, how little of all my favorite people that I've seen, um, once they pop in and I think, oh my God, like I, I forgot you, not that I forgot you existed, but I forgot how much I love you. And I forgot how much I enjoy conversing with you, um, yeah. because I get so comfortable at home that I forget how much I love people. It's too easy for me to get a little cynical and say like, I'm fine. I don't, you know, I don't need people, but I do, I do. And so when people come back into the bookstore after a long time, I just feel my heart surge. It's like, oh, I'm so happy you're back. And I'm so happy to, you know, to uh, feel that again, because um, it's easy to forget, you know, especially yeah. for, for the hermits amongst us. So. <laughs> well said, well said. So the message there is, if you want to make Jane happy, go visit her at Bear Pond Books. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Please do. I might forget your name for a minute, you know, but <laughs> it's join the give club. Me, just give me like five minutes and it'll come to me. It's, <laughs> it's just because of the mask. It's it's because of the mask. Sure, sure. We'll call it that. Do we have any last minute questions or comments? We have three more minutes before we wrap this baby up. Um, I hope you're all gonna go check out the books that uh, we we made on our list, our special list of Vermont authors. Um, so check those out if you can and or come in, stop in and I'll show them to you. Um, but you know, I'm so happy that you all joined us tonight. Um, pop on in if you wanna say good night or anything else. Um, it's a free for all. Last two minutes of free for all. <laughs> well, on behalf of Cliff, I just want to express our heartfelt thanks um, to everyone at Bear Pond Books and to Jane and to Sam and to Christy and Catherine and Lita uh, and to all of our other friends on this call. Um, we are all doing our best to uh, stay connected with stories and books and reading and writing and share that with the next generation. Uh, and uh, this is such a wonderful thing uh, for you all to do to help us be able to do that. So um, check out our website if you want to see what we're up to these days. Uh, and uh, when it's, whenever it's safe, come join us and see one of our presentations in person. It may be a little while before that's safe, but uh, that's the best. And uh, thanks again so much. It was just a pleasure to see you all tonight. And thank you for what you're doing, Cliff. Yes, thank you, Cliff. Oh, many thank you, Cliff. Thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to Jane and Cliff and Sam, wherever she is. and. Uh, We'll see you, I hope. Yes, thank you. It has been a thrill to be part of this. We will have signed copies of the books. I've uh, been told that Christy and Lita will get Lita in and Catherine will pop in, sign some books for you. So if you want them inscribed um, to anyone in particular, you can write that in the notes when you um, place your order online or you can give us a call. You can call me anytime. Um, we will make that happen. So thank you so much. Um, I'd love to see all of you here. I'm very, very thankful to have this community um, and have a wonderful evening. I'm gonna go to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Read in bed. <laughs> exactly. Read in bed. my favorite part of the day. <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Thanks all. Thank you Have so a great much night. for joining us. And for Lita. Oh, dog. dog. I see a dog. Yay, Great. dog. <laughs> thank you for coming, everyone. We'll see oh, you. Oh, thank you. It was great. And be, get, be sure you, to give my love to your daughter. <laughs> oh, I will. Thank you so much. Keep writing. We'll keep oh. writing. And here your dog is kissing you, and I would I locked mine out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, Christy, do you have a greyhound?